Okay, I think we'll get started. It's 4 o'clock. Um, I want to, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Truex. I'm here with the planning department. And first of all, I want to thank Michael Brady and Joe Blaylock, the chairs of the Department of Urban Planning and Landscape Architecture, for helping sponsor this. The department's pitched in to bring uh, Jimmy here. Um, the gentleman you're going to hear from um, is one of my heroes. He and his wife, Janet, um, have been involved. You're going to hear a great story of their involvement, their commitment. Um, and I know there's a group here studying activists. And when I would, if I were to give a definition of activists, it would give me a Janet Doro would fit into that very well for their commitment uh, of their life and what they're doing for um, not only the people of Waco, as you understand, but people around the world for what they do. So I've had the pleasure of getting to know Jimmy over the last, I think when we were trying to remember when we first met, I know I met him through some conferences, um, uh, uh, CCDA conferences. But officially we met in 2004 when I brought him into Indianapolis for a series of, of lectures and things. And it's just been a great, great fun uh, to get a chance to know him and the things they're involved with. So. Um, welcome, please, Jimmy Doro from um, Waco, Texas. And uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for coming up. Yep. And braving the cold, it's, it's really been great. So. This is cold for us. Well, it is a privilege to be here. Um, I'm trying to think what connection I had to Ball State. There was something else. I watched to see if you went on your basketball games. And you're doing pretty well this year, right? Sound like good. Um, thank you for coming. I, I want to tell you the quick story how we got to where we are. Uh, I grew up in a middle class Christian home in near Houston, Texas, a little bitty town. I was your classic uh, kid in the 60s when racial prejudice was at its height. Um, King was marching. Uh, I grew up in a very divided city where the whites and blacks and a few browns back then lived in different parts of the community. And I uh, uh, really never even considered the fact that that wasn't right, which is a shame. That's the biggest sad travesty of the whole deal, that I really grew up in a divided world that somehow should have been challenged, especially by the church that I grew up in. But we didn't talk about those kind of issues. Uh, in 1967, I remember when my home church began to pass the rumor that the blacks were coming to our white church. And we were told to be sure they didn't come in, that deacons would make sure they didn't get in. Can you imagine? Now, for many of you that are young, you can't even believe that was in the same century, much less uh, in somebody's lifetime. But that's the world I grew up in. I went on to Baylor University to go study. Uh, my background, my study has been in uh, theology and community development. And I am a strong believer that uh, that is a good marriage, as I'll talk about in a little bit. But I... Uh, uh, got involved as a youth director in the community working with uh, kids, just basically good kids that went to school. And as a church youth director, I'd go visit them in their schools, got involved uh, with them in the community. The deal was, um, as I walked around working in Waco, I began to realize there was a lot of poverty there. Uh, anybody here social work types? Anybody a social worker? What does it mean to be poor in America? What is the threshold of income for a family of four to be considered poor in America? Anybody know? You want to take a guess? A little bit higher. Uh, actually, 24 to 50. If a family of four has a total income of less than $24,000, $250, then they are considered poor by the federal government. 46 million Americans live in poverty in America. Um, the average city has about 13.3% of those in their own communities on average. Muncie is much higher than that, as is Waco. Waco's poverty rate is 28.7, more than double the, the national average. I think somebody said yours was 30.1 or something like that. So um, I didn't realize that was there until I began to work in the community of Waco. And as I did so, I realized that most of the poverty in my city was African American. We were still a segregated city. Uh, civil rights was beginning to grow in significant ways. And the poor, who were mostly African American, were moving across the river into our part of town. 
I say our part, the, the white part of town. I was a Baylor student, so I was on the campus. Um, I didn't know much about those issues, and I, I had a lot of questions. I was a, a questioner. hope some of you are. Don't accept things as they are. They don't have to be that way. And I had a call one day by an African-American pastor named Dewey Pinckney, who was also president of the NAACP in Waco. All I knew as a white guy is that was a pretty powerful voice for the African-American community. He said, would you bring your youth group over to our part of town, which was called No Man's Land? Uh, no Man's Land was this little pocket of poverty between Bellmead, the adjoining city, and Waco that nobody would take. It was so poor. Houses, there was a house I remember going into uh, just to see what was inside because there was a tree growing through the front porch. And we walked up knowing nobody lived in it and we just wanted to see inside. We pushed the door open and when we did, a man screamed. A man was living in there. He was one of the few white guys in the whole area, but he was completely blind, living alone in a house without running water. Rats and roaches ran everywhere as soon as we opened the door. And the smell of poverty was overwhelming. I will never forget it. I was 19 years old, a college student. And it overwhelmed me to think, what, how can it be in the richest nation in the world, less than two miles away from where I'm going to school, that kind of poverty could exist? I was overwhelmed. I just couldn't believe it was real. Went home and... Uh, with some different changes, we began to work more over there in no man's land and got to know the kids real well and got involved. It affected my students who were um, growing to understand more about racial reconciliation. So through the years, that was a big part of my life. Then I went from there to work in a state home. The state home was an interesting atmosphere. It's a place where if a child or a teenager had ever been sexually or physically abused, the, the state of Texas would take away the rights of the parents to keep that child in their house. So there was a whole institution of about 300 kids that lived and grew up in the state home because of child abuse or neglect. I was the new recreation guy. Didn't know what I was doing. Got out there on the campus. Never been been out there but a couple times for an interview. And I stopped to talk to a house parent to try to find out where the gymnasium was. And so when I interrupted them, this six-year-old kid that was being talked to by the house parent uh, turned and cussed me out. <laughs> this six-year-old kid with just violent words and nasty words coming out of this child. I was like, how can this be? How can anybody talk so ugly uh, with, in, in an atmosphere of an adult? So anyway, I went on to the gym, opened up the door. The kids began to play ball and basketball. And in a few minutes, uh, two guys got into a fight. And they picked up chairs, were hitting each other across the head, and blood was flowing. and It was the worst day of the worst week of my life. I have never seen such anger and violence and disrespect. Now think about it from their perspective. These kids who had been abused by their own parents who should have taught them how to love and, and be mature and grow up. Uh, I'm just another adult in their life. Uh, why would they trust me? What did I do to earn that? So I went out on Friday night to a park. We have this big in-city in park there in Waco and I remember walking around just lamenting how much I hated my job that I'd just gotten, thinking, how'd I get out of this? Now, from a Christian perspective, I kind of thought I was helping God out, but uh, I realized as I reminded him I had gone to church and done all these good things that uh, I was kind of there to help, and it's like, he didn't care. That wasn't, that wasn't What he wanted me to go back and love. And so based on my worldview, on Monday morning, kind of not happy about it, went back to work, but I changed my attitude. Now, I know how hard it is to love people in general, but it was hard to love those kids and teenagers. But for the next three years, I did the best I could. How do you get past words? How do you get past attitudes? And so for three years, I learned to love those kids and really began to care about them more than your normal kid, whatever that means. At the end of that, I went on to graduate school, studied um, in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I would go to work in the urban projects. There was a downtown project there in Fort Worth where I was working. And so I was the high school director. And again, a world that I didn't grow up in. There was crack cocaine all over the streets. There was domestic violence. Twelve-year-old girl got pregnant in the neighborhood. How could that be? And The world that I had been protected from as a small-time religious kid in the community, now I'm wondering, what does this morning all this study of theology have to do with the real world that is right there in front of me? There was nobody down there. There was in, in this... This gap of reality was very frustrating for me. 
So at the end of that, my wife and I got married. We worked in Houston for about three years. But um, at the end of those three years, we came to a place where we thought, you know what, we want our lives to matter. And how can we live a life that's got some worth to it? So we, we said, first thing we got to do is see the world. So we had a little house there in uh, West Houston, sold our house to make enough money to buy two tickets around the world. We had a one-year-old child by then, so the child was free. But we bought an open ticket in the old Pan Am. Used to, they could, you could go either way around the world. And we got an open ticket to took, take off. And for the next four and a half months, we went around the world. And we went and hung out with people all over. Uh, our goal was to see the world as it is. We went to Europe. I saw the beautiful cathedrals and took pictures of all those things. But you know what I found out? The kids that are your age didn't go to those cathedrals anymore. They are what's called postmoderns. Postmodernity is a way of thinking today that Western culture, particularly the Western youth culture, has walked away from the church. Today in Western Christianity in particular, 53,000 people leave the church every week. They've walked away from institutional church. They may or may not believe in God still, but I'd talk to a bunch of students there in Paris, France on the street and ask them what they believe. And they would say, we are post-Christian. We are post-modern. We reject the culture that we grew up in. Our grandparents went to the cathedral, but we don't anymore. So a really a time of change, even though the, the pictures were great, the reality was things were really different in that part of the world. At that point, the, the wall was still up, so we went into the Eastern Bloc for a little bit of time, and then we came out, and then began to go around the world. We ended up in South Korea. Uh, I love South Korea, and uh, the largest church in the world is in South Korea, by the way. It was uh, a church that had uh, 250,000 members when we were there, that five years later we went back and there was 500,000 members. Today, over one million members of one church. Hard to fathom. So those of us that grew up in the West... Uh, are unaware, particularly in a Buddhist culture that had become Christian, uh, there was a, just an amazing commitment. And these guys were get up two hours before work and go pray. They would go get in these concrete hovels on this retreat center and pray and fast for days. And many of them were going to be missionaries. I'd never seen that kind of zeal, particularly in the Western culture, but it was really fascinating to me. We went on around, ended up in Malaysia, Singapore, places like that. But our last stop was India. Uh, I love India. We go there still frequently. India is an amazing culture. It's one-third the size of the United States, three times more people, 1.2 billion people. Uh, very religiously diverse. You've got um, about 800 million Hindus, of whom um, make up the majority of the country. Uh, the second largest number of Muslims in the world are in India. Uh, there is a large group of uh, other religious cultures, that usually small percentages. You've got Zoroastrians and Taoists, and Christianity is only a small 3% in the south, 1% in the north. Um, but outwardly religious people. I mean, it's just such a different culture than us. We are a very secular culture by background. And so uh, we spent time there and finally went over to find Mother Teresa in Calcutta. I got to meet her. It was one of my joys in life that my wife and I have spent about uh, 30 minutes with her in her house and, and went to work in the slums that she had worked in. And there was a place called the, uh, the Mother House, uh, this place where the Sisters of Charity early in the morning would get up and pray about 4.30, and then they'd take the little rickshaws and they would go down to the train stations. And in the train stations would be the beggars, uh, people who were just at their last bit of life, and they would be asking uh, train riders to give them some rupees. And these folks were in, were in such bad health, many of them were dying or near death. The Sisters of Charity would go down, and they would scoop up these bodies uh, before they died and take them in a rickshaw back to what they called Kaligat. It was the name for the mother house. Fifty beds for women, fifty beds for men. And in this particular place, they would try to do the best they could, put an IV in their arm, feed them if they could eat. Uh, they would uh, shave them, clean them up. Uh, volunteers from around the world would come there. I challenge you, if you ever want to change your life, get up and go to India and work in those places. It will help reorganize your thinking patterns for sure. And uh, so we got there and we served for several days and, and uh, worked in the slums. One particular day, we were invited to go to a different slum, and the greeting in India is this. They hold up their hands and they say, Namaste. It really means, I salute the divine qualities I see in you. And I noticed the bandages on these people's hands and their feet. I thought, well, it's kind of weird. So as we walked in, uh, I asked the translator, I said, what's the deal with all the bandages? 
And he said, didn't I tell you? I said, tell me what? He said, well, these are lepers. Now, I didn't even know leprosy still existed in the world. I thought it was gone. Uh, there used to be a leper hospital in Carville, Louisiana that's no longer there. But leprosy is not a painful disease at all. It is painless. What happens to a leper is first they get these spots that identify the disease, and then soon after, they can be a high caste Brahmin, and they are now kicked out of the slums, uh, into the slums, to live among the poor beggars. And uh, it's a really difficult uh, situation there. So what happens, though, is they don't hurt themselves. They're very isolated because they're cu cut off from their family in some cases, or in some cases the families even come live with them. But there in the slums, they hurt themselves because they can't feel. The leprosy, the ha called Hansen's disease legally, uh, takes away their feelings in their fingers and toes. So they cook their food on the open fire. And what happens is sometimes their hand gets too close and they burn the hand, but they don't pull back because they can't feel it. Or get a cut, a glass cut maybe on a foot, have an infection, not realize it's infected. Eventually that infection turns into gangrene and they have to have their leg amputated. Every night in leper slums, rats literally eat their toes off. Can you imagine that kind of world? And because of the pain, painlessness, they don't even know it till they awaken in the morning. Well, when you go from my little world to the slums of Calcutta, that are in, it begins to make you wake up and think you know, about life. Today in your world, 21,000 children will die of hunger-related causes. Today! 21,000 kids will breathe their last breath. And these are not children that die from diseases that can't be cured. They're easily cured. Most of them are not clean, drinking clean water. One billion people do not get to drink clean water every day. A world of 7.3 billion, one billion has no clean water. We work in Haiti and Mexico City and India as well as the work in Waco. We drill water wells in Haiti. We are able to drill wells that provide water for 800 people on any given uh, well, and so mostly in the Northeast there. Uh, we do school sponsorships. We work with microcredit programs for the poorest of the poor. Uh, we, we get engaged. We have 400 children that are going to school in a village we work in, in Haiti. So we found ways to make sure that at least the children we work with have a chance. They, some still die. But we, as we work there uh, and, and realize that the, the pain of this world is overwhelming, the word compassion comes from two Latin words. It means to suffer with. Sometimes we think compassion just means feeling sorry for people. Oh, those poor kids. Or I feel sorry for them. By the way, what is worse than guilt? What, what, what do you think in terms of caring for the world? What is a worse emotion than guilt? Yeah. Absolutely. I don't give a rip. So what does it have to do with me that those 21,000 kids die? That's their problem. I'm taking care of my life. We've got enough of our own problems. Apathy is, is a driving force in a culture. It's the way we deal with it. We blame the victim for their problems. It's their fault. Uh, now, it's, it's easy to say here, but when you have a mama standing in front of you holding a baby that she birthed just a few hours early that dies in the night, it will overwhelm you. And so here we are in the middle of the last part of our trip, overwhelmed by poverty and leprosy and brokenness. And we said to ourselves, what are we going to do with our lives? You know, what do you do after you've seen that kind of pain? Compassion means you get up out of your place of, self, of security and self safety and get in the middle of the pain. The word means to enter the pain. And so we said, we can't just ignore this. So we came back to Waco. We were about to have a second baby. Came to Waco, which is just a small town. But we decided because of our, what we'd seen and heard, we had to move in the middle of the problem. Compassion for us meant moving into a neighborhood that was broken. Now, Waco is like a lot of cities where you've got um, people that were mostly poor, were mostly African-American in Waco, and the white rich lived in a neighborhood that I now live in, but that was back before the, the Civil Rights Movement. And the Civil Rights Movement came, the poor began to move across the river, and the white flight happened to the suburbs. And as that happened, this neighborhood flipped. Not only did it become all African-American, uh, the poverty was there, and so... We had prostitutes on our streets. We had crack dealers all over the corners. Down the street from where ha the house we bought, there was an old shopping center that used to be where the nice folks went to see their movie called the Texas Theater. Uh, that became uh, a porno theater during the time we lived there. Three bars in that old shopping center. And uh, my kids, we had four children. We were just down the street, and uh, people thought we'd lost our mind living in this bad neighborhood, supposedly. 
Uh, we bought a house. I live in a large house. You come to my house, you won't feel sorry for us. I live in a large 4,000 square foot house. But we bought the house for $4,000, uh, for $12,000. Uh, the play, the, across the street was a bar called the Chat and Chew. Uh, we had no, no, and in Texas, if you don't have air conditioning, you're in big, big trouble because we, it's so stinking hot, especially in the summer and in August. And so we um, lived without air conditioning for about that many years. But the place had been bought out by slumlords. The whole neighborhood it used to be rich neighborhood people. Now we're slumlord houses. They would cram these people into these old houses. And we had uh, two mentally ill guys on one side, a kid upstairs that had all kinds of uh, problems and rats and roaches in the house there. And then downstairs there was a lady we called the cat lady. She had 40 cats that had not been outside the house in, uh, in several years of mental breakdown, and she'd go out at night and feed them raw liver in the alleyways. She'd take this butcher paper and take her little... So it was just a messed up old house right there in the bad neighborhood, and we bought it. We said, this is our new home. This, we're going to live here. I've been living in that same house for 35 years. I love my neighborhood. I'm going to talk about uh, the privilege that we've had to be in the middle of the pain and work amongst the, the people that I have come to become, call my friends. Um, I will say this, and you can understand this very easily. My father-in-law, my, our, our, her parents, uh, clearly had a hard time with it. Spent his whole life working so that his daughter would never be in a, quote, bad neighborhood. Uh, and I understand from their perspective where they were coming from. So those were, those were tensions. When you make choices like we made, there's always going to be the struggle of the culture and the status quo. Because living authentically for whatever you believe, will cost you at some level. So uh, I had a full-time job working as a grant writer and a program director, but every afternoon I'd come home to my neighborhood where the children would come over, and we called them king's clubs. We would do uh, games and uh, all kinds of activities with the children. I built a basketball court at my house. If you come to my house on any given Sunday night, there's going to be about 30 guys out there playing ball, and this is not sissy white ball ball this is street ball and they are slamming it and talking about my mother and it's just crazy atmosphere but my my house became a place where the kids came and so we began to love those kids and um, my kids and played with them and we got a this great uh, experience together but then the problems began to come they would talk about they didn't have any food they would talk about the fact that my mama uh, got beaten last night by my dad or we're struggling with some addiction in our house the realities of people's lives were now our problem. It's one thing to take a little mission trip somewhere and take a bunch of pictures of people that are living in poverty, but that's not the same. Now we're in the middle of the mess, not having any answers. We didn't know what we were doing, but we knew that getting incarnationally in the middle of it would be the thing. So through the years, uh, we have created what is now called Mission Waco, Mission World. We still work globally. But Waco, Texas is our primary target. Let me show you just a few uh, quick pictures of some of the things that um, have happened there. Uh, these are our three goals. We are, first of all, an empowerment-based ministry. We believe there's a whole lot of difference between empowerment and relief. I know you mean well when you give somebody food or money, and there are times to do that. When there is a crisis, and I mean a crisis, the earthquake in Haiti is an example. You bring your money, you bring your stuff, you do whatever you have. When people are in real crisis, the problem is we don't know when to quit helping because there are times when once, if, for example, as a parent, I know that if I do everything for my child, I'll give you an example, I, my, we have a daughter that grew up in the neighborhood that we now live in that was living in the back of a van with her dad who just gotten out of prison. Her mom was prostituting and we helped them and she came to live with us. Well, when she was about in the seventh grade, she came in one day and said, will you help me with my homework? And so his math, and I'd forgotten all my math formulas. And so as we uh, began to work on the math, she said, I need to go to the bathroom. So she left. Well, I kept, I was, I'm an achiever. I had to figure this stuff out. So I kept working at it and finally figured out the formulas. And she was nowhere to be found. Well, I found her in there watching television. She abandoned it. it was, now it was my problem. It was my homework, not hers. And I did real well on her homework, but she didn't learn anything. Empowerment is the mindset that says the best help I can do with people is to help them find their own gifts, their own sense of self-worth. Now, they need friends. They need support systems. The problem is for many of us, when do you quit helping if it's been a crisis 
and began to let them own the responsibility. That's a very difficult tension. And it's in different times with different people. It's not like there's an age or anything like that. So empowerment is what we're about. Uh, let me give you an example. We um, don't give Christmas toys away. We believe that the parents who are poor want to give their own kids. They have dignity. And we don't treat them that way. We want that good feeling. We say, well, let's take the turkey over and let's take the, the toy over and give it to those poor people and take their picture and put it on my refrigerator. We just took away their dignity. Okay? How do you think it feels to be a father who can't provide for your own kids at Christmas time? So we have this big toy store. We've got a bunch of ugly bikers. We do this toy run and get all this stuff. Hundreds and hundreds of people come. And we sell... If you gave me a $10 toy, we're going to sell it for $2 in the toy store. They can afford two. They can't afford 10 But they get the privilege to go buy for their own children, to wrap those presents, put under their own tree, so they get the joy for their own kids. You see the difference? But we have created this, especially in the, the benevolence world, we've created this sort of um, demeaning approach to help. We don't know what to do, so we have food pantries and clothes closets and ask nothing of the people. Empowerment says, I believe in you. I love you enough to let you grow up. And learning to know when to let go and, and make them do it or not to help out is always the tension. Uh, in our homeless shelter, we've got, got a 56-bed shelter. Uh, we charge $2 a night after the first week. Like, why do you charge homeless people? Because they've got to make responsible choices. So for 30 days they can stay, but they, and if it's below 35 degrees or above 100, there's no charge. But as long as they can, we ask them to come up with $2 or mop the kitchen or take out the garbage, but do something. Have a sense of worth because ultimately they can't stay in the shelter forever. How are we going to help them become mature and move on? So, and these are my friends, so they, they feel fine about that. We have a lot of ways we do empowerment that is really important. And so part of the discussion today may be how do you get there from relief into development? Second thing we do is we mobilize middle class Christians in particular, but also middle class people to understand poverty. Most of you know about poverty, but you don't really understand the details. We have about 10 myths that we deal with that are passed around. People are poor because of this. Well, they're lazy. They're this. They're that. So much misinformation. So let me tell you the main way we do that, and I'll invite you to Waco, Texas to find out. We have a weekend called the Poverty Simulation. For the last 30 years, we have a weekend where 42 hours from Friday night at 8 o'clock until Sunday afternoon at 2.30, you become poor. There is no better training. This, what I'm doing today does not change your behavior. I love being here. I'm privileged to be here. and appreciate uh, the invitation. But let me tell you what I know. Just because I'm telling you information, we call it cognitive dumping, doesn't change your behavior. Well, I want you to know that world and be informed correctly to do something. So that means training really at its best is always going to be experiential with cognitive. And so this weekend, I won't tell you anything more about it because part of poverty is powerlessness. And if I tell you what happens, that means you'll know how to prepare for it. So I'm just going to invite you to wake up. It costs you $65 to be poor. How about that? I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I will tell you that uh, most people survive. We've never had anybody die. Uh, and we also have watched it change lives in ways you can't even imagine. So... Uh, if you're on a student group trip or looking for a way to, to get away uh, to do something meaningful, consider that. It's all on the website. There's 12 times a year we do that, and uh, the information is there. All right. So, the, uh, And by the way, there's other things we do that I won't go into time-wise. And then we also address systemic injustice. Yes, if you're on crack cocaine, you're going to be poor. You're going to waste your money on addiction. It's hard to get off. So we do alcohol and drug recovery. But the reality is uh, that's not the only reason people are poor. If you're making minimum wage today, seven twenty-five an hour, and you worked every hour of a year, 2,080 hours, and you multiply that out, that's $15,080. I just said if you're a family of uh, four making below $24,250, you are considered poor. That's almost $9,000 below Working full time. Don't tell me that woman is that mama with three kids is poor, is lazy. I, she will work circles around you. She gets her early and gets her kids to school and other than to the babysitter and works all day in a job she doesn't particularly like and makes seven twenty five. And we whine because uh, we don't want to give up more money to our employees uh, while. CEOs in America are making a thousand times more than they used to make just 10 years ago while minimum wage continues to go down. So we fight against systemic injustice. 
We work on issues like racial reconciliation. We still live in a very divided culture, folks, and you know this. I mean, you should know it this year of all years. It's been a hard year. Uh, racial issues swell back up. We think we're, we got it together, but they have. And, but you know what I know? We don't talk. We don't talk about it very much. At least we didn't in my culture. We never sat around and said, what do we got to do to make some changes and do this right and listen and hear? You know, it's interesting when you ask African Americans or Hispanics the same question I ask you, the answers are different how we see things. But we don't have a forum by which to really openly discuss, discuss those. So those are some of the kinds of things we do. Uh, these are the kinds of programs I do. I'll give you some, uh, a couple of ideas in a minute. We do job training. If you want to be empowered, the best thing is a job. So we help a lot of people. My neighborhood is filled with unemployed folks. Some of them are ex-offenders. If you have come out of jail after paying your price for your offense, uh, people are ready to change their life. But if you can't find an employer that will give you a chance, you guess what's going to happen? Recidivism. You're going to end up in that same cycle again. So we work really hard. We have a whole deal called I'm not a bad person that's uh, uh, kind of a... Uh, there used to be a thing called check the box where we work with ex-offenders to help them get jobs. But we um, also have uh, programs like um, the teenagers. I grew up in a culture where my little town where I played Little League Baseball and Mr. Quinn was my coach. Mr. Quinn owned the drugstore. When I got to be 14 years old, back then it was easier to get a job doing that, Mr. Quinn hired me to mop floors. I learned how to work. I have a work ethic. Now, I am, I'll be honest, I am around a lot of rich students today, in Baylor particularly, where they don't know how to work any better than the other people. Just because you uh, grew up uh, in a certain way doesn't mean you know how to work or hold a broom. But I, I learned that because of Mr. Quinn. But in my neighborhood, if you're 20 years old and nobody can help you find a job, then you're in big, big trouble because you need somebody to, to advocate because there's 20 people trying to get that one job everywhere, you, even the minimum wage jobs. So we have a full job training program for urban kids that has been very successful, and uh, we work with employers to help them uh, train folks. As well, we do uh, lots of urban teen programs. I have two kind of programs in my program. One is the high-risk kid that is um, really in trouble. This is the kid that, that uh, got in Gabe Dominguez runs. Gabe went to prison for selling guns to the Mexican mafia. That's my youth director today. <laughs> he went to federal prison, and uh, he was a bad kid. But, boy, he got his life turned around, and today this man loves the broken kid. He's working with the, the teenagers that are in juvenile. He goes to the, a tall alternative school and hangs out with them. We have a whole hip-hop music program where he brings them in. They're talking their nasty mouth smack stuff. He said, no, you can't use those words here. But let's hear your story. And they work through the pain of their own lives as they talk about their brother who was shot or their mama who didn't have food. And through this kind of unique hip-hop music therapy, uh, kids are dealing with their pain and working through those issues and ultimately getting jobs. So we have those programs. We have a children's program that's amazing. Our children's program uh, has all kinds of levels. We, we do tutoring, uh, which we actually make sure we measure. It's one thing to tell everybody we, we're helping those kids, but what does that really mean? So can you show me how much that child has learned in reading and math, not just blow it up to a big deal? We have engineering as a part of that class. We're teaching kids STEM classes. through That same kid who is a mess in the classroom because he feels behind and misunderstood, you put a robotics class together, and now he's down there playing and playing on the computer, learning stuff in ways he never even knows he's learning. Uh, we have chess classes where you learn to think strategically as an eight-year-old urban kid because you kind of think outside of the, the self-gratification, the, the instant gratification that we work with in our culture particularly in the city. So uh, we do those. We have ballet, we have cello, and our urban kids are learning how to, to the bigger world. We got some, we're doing a fundraising thing right now to raise enough money for some of those kids to get to go to um, New York City to see a, a play up there. We have a full theater. Uh, we've got uh, our, the, the theater in that old shopping center. It used to be the Texas Theater that became a porno theater. It now is a theater where we actually teach drama and acting and our kids just want a big improv thing in a, in a club. So good programs there. Alcohol and drug rehab for the men. Our women's program is, is um, still raising money again for it. Uh, this is a three-phase program that uh, you've you got to talk about drugs. I mean, drugs are everywhere. They're all over the streets uh, for just a little bit of money. Crack cocaine uh, is the, if you're working a job you hate and you get off 
the bus is so easy to get trapped in that cycle of dependency, but there's very few places to go to get help, particularly if you're poor. Uh, we have a homeless shelter, a 56-bed shelter that also has a transitional program. Uh, we teach GED classes. We have a donation clinic. Uh, if you, well before Obamacare, people would go to the emergency rooms always to wait for hours and hours to get help, and the hospitals didn't like it because they were costing them so much money. So we created a, uh, a two night a week uh, volunteer doctors, volunteer uh, nurses, and then some dental care that's associated with that. So it is amazing to hear the stories of the people. Do you know what, it, what it's like to be homeless? and have an abscessed tooth and nowhere to go. The pain, uh, you know how much it hurts to have a bad tooth. And you're so immobilized, you can't do anything. Well, now we have some resources, certainly not enough, but we've got some. Um, we have school supply and toy store, I told you about that, same, same kind of philosophy there. We have a breakfast, we have 125 homeless that have breakfast every Friday for the last 30 years. Uh, and then we have a, an attorney, a Baylor student who came back and said, I don't want to make corporate money anymore, I want to help the poor, and he and his wife moved in with very little money. We didn't have much to offer him, and uh, he is doing legal clinics and helping people in so many ways. This is just a portion. There's more that we do. There's 70 staff in our organization today that are now helping the poor all across town. Let me show you some of the pictures of those. Um, I went through. I went through those. Oh, we have. I didn't talk. The World Cup Cafe is our. Um, um, we have a cafe in the corner next to the theater that used to be where the bar was there. And uh, we won number one restaurant last year. We think it's so funny because this is a neighborhood nobody would come back to. They were scared to death of our neighborhood. And now we've got a couple of uh, older white middle class women playing bridge in our back room that's got fair trade in it that it's their favorite place to come and the food is great. So economic development is a part of healing broken neighborhoods. You can't just do programs. You've got to bring economic development, and that's not easy. How do you encourage businesses to come back to a neighborhood that's going to be much more challenging to make money? So we do that as well. So uh, uh, this is, I don't have time to go deep into this. We believe, uh, from a Christian worldview perspective, we miss so much. We're out there talking so superficially about things, but God has always cared for the injustices of the world. It's from, you can go from the first page to the last page. Justice is the is a key issue, but I grew up never hearing that and learning how to advocate for people, how to stand in the gap, how to begin to push against the systems. Let me tell you, most systems are not, they're not mean people. They're not trying to go create bad things, but, but just like individuals have issues and we have our own patterns of mess, systemic injustice happens in culture. My neighborhood schools in my neighborhood are not nearly as good as the suburban schools. Why? Money. There's not the resources. Well, who's going to stand up for those voiceless kids, those mamas who have no voice? Who's going to bring uh, healing back to the neighborhoods and the lack of services? So we do all that in, uh, in, in kind of lots of ways, I guess. Uh, just quickly, just going to show you some pictures and talk about a couple more things. Um, I love our neighborhood. It's been there so long. My children grew up in it. They're all adults now. Uh, let me tell you, my kids grew up without prejudice. When you grow up in a multicultural neighborhood, you don't bring all the baggage that I grew up with in a very segregated world. So we decided, I had the money. I could have moved to the suburbs. Our kids could have gotten better science and math than what I did. But I wanted the values of not having prejudice, of not feeling like the world owes me anything. So my children... Two of them have master's degrees. It wasn't like they were dumb kids because they didn't get the best education. It's just they got more of an education around other issues. I'm around so many middle-class people that are scared to death to get in the middle of social justice issues because there's, they've been so um, segregated so long that they don't even think they can trust it. Let me go through some things here. This is a picture of... We, we do a lot of music videos and things. This Gabe's not in this picture, but... Um, we do a lot of that stuff. Just did a video last week. Um, urban teen programs. Um, some tough kids. Uh, we do job training. This guy. This guy was a homeless man. Uh, he's a Navajo by background, but uh, ended up on the streets uh, in Waco. Uh, his addiction. You know what his addiction was? It wasn't alcohol or drugs or mental illness. It was uh, Best Buy. He, he was. He'd been, he, he was a videographer for a television company. Be careful. Uh, there, uh, but he loves stuff like you do. 
You know, and everything, every time something new came out at Best Buy, he would go buy it, and all of a sudden he woke up. Yeah, you're looking at him, aren't you? He's, he's, he's one of those. All of a sudden you wake up one day, and you don't have any discretionary money, and you can't pay the bills. And this man ended up with his family on the streets for a period of time. And this is just a neighborhood kid that uh, we helped get a job. Um, I'm going to tell you about this in a minute. I'll come back to health care. Uh, we, uh, we advocate for the homeless in our community a lot, so we do things like the... Uh, Walk for the homeless every year, where we spend. It's, we walk about just about a mile and a half, but we stop at eight different organizations. People don't. Many of you are uninformed. You're good people, but you really don't understand. It's like you're gonna have to step into this world long enough to really know the issues and realize so much of what we talk about is misinformation. So we do that on that particular walk. Uh, the performing arts theater. Uh, let me. I want to tell you one story about a kid in my program. His name is Stevie Walker Webb. He was an 11 year old kid that came to our children's program. And Stevie uh, ended up, uh, we did help hip hop, I mean, uh, dancing and uh, step dance and all that kind of stuff. And then um, he was a poor kid, African American, that had had a hard time with his dad, had beaten him some. But he came one day uh, and asked me, could I help him go to college? And I said, yeah, we can do that. Because we know that today, if you don't have at least a, two more years of college, your chances of getting a decent job are horrible. So a, a full paying living wage job. Steve went off to North Texas, got a degree in sociology and fine arts. At the end of that, he called me and said, will you help me get my master's of fine arts? And I said, I'd love to, but we can't do that. I don't have that kind of money. And I said, but I will hire you as our first theater director. Stevie came back to the Jubilee Theater, and it was the most incredible three years of our life there. He talented like you wouldn't believe. Now, remember, he's African American. He wrote a, his first play he wrote was called We Ain't the Huxtables. And it was this... Uh, it was this uh, kind of parody on uh, the, 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 the show, uh, more real life from, for him. Um, we did Broadway plays. We've done, we do two Broadway plays each semester, mostly with lower income folks that have never been in theater. Uh, we have uh, urban expressions where we do uh, visual arts, pottery, and uh, arts with uh, different people. We know that the arts are so helpful for urban kids. But the schools don't offer them much anymore, so I challenge you that are talented like that. This is a great place to use your skills. Uh, and then Stevie uh, finally got a call one day, three years after he was working with us, from a New York drama school called the, the um, New York, let's see, what's it called? Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a fancy school, one of the best in the nation, and they had three scholarships. 1,200 people that applied, he got one of those scholarships. So this poor neighborhood kid is now finishing his last two months in graduate school to get his MFA. He went and did an extra that he was so good at it, he got an award called the Princess Grace Award. I didn't even know what that was, but it was a big deal. And then he was invited by New York University to come over and do another semester on uh, theater of the oppressed. How do you use theater to help people in uh, struggle? So amazing kid. He'll come back, I hope. Um, we may lose him and have him... He may have his name in light somewhere else, but uh, that's the kind of stuff that we do in plays like this. Uh, the World Cup Cafe uh, is, again, this is on the corner across the street. I'm going to tell you about the grocery store in just a minute. We, we have street dances. We, my broken old neighborhood, nobody would come over there for the first few, so we did the theater, and we, but then we, we'd do music festivals, and then we would do other kind of things. How do you bring healing and hope? We think neighborhood. We don't think individuals. So our whole community development means... How do you bring health and life so you create activities by which we do? We have a big walk and a bunch of things every year. We also, I told you, worked in Mexico City. We work in an orphanage for physically and mentally disabled children. A little Catholic nun that is my hero. She's 84 years old and has 250 children that we've been there when there wasn't enough food to eat. So these are kids that we have loved through the years. Uh, these are, that's my, these are my, this, this kid is, he, when he starts squeezing you, he hugs you. He squeezes the life out of you. You can hardly breathe. He loves you so much. He's like, please quit. And she has a stick. She'll go get him sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, we work in Haiti. We do, uh, it's actually $219 now. But these are children that would not get to go to school otherwise. Because uh, in our community, uh, in Haiti altogether, you have to pay to go to school. But not only do you pay for them to go to school, they get to eat one meal a day. Most of the 400 children that we sponsor uh, would not eat a meal a day had it not been for the sponsorship. Let me tell you one more cool thing. This is who we are. 
Uh, I've been working with the homeless a long time. And so I went into Friday morning breakfast one day, and I said, guys, I owe you an apology, uh, guys and women. I never even offered you a chance to be a part of this, but we have a few more kids that haven't been sponsored. Would you guys be interested as a team to sponsor a child in Haiti? Now, these are homeless people, Friday morning, 6 a.m. every week. And they said, absolutely, we'd love to do that. So every, every week, they would bring in a quarter, bring in a dollar, whatever they could afford, put it in, the, in that uh, little bucket. When they got their first child, we, sent, we gave them the picture of the child they sponsored, and they said, we want another one. Today, the homeless in Waco sponsor four children in Haiti. Now, that's dignity. I mean, yeah, they're at the bottom of the bottom. They're, they're broken people, but don't tell me homeless people don't have values and care. They do care. So because of that, uh, they come in every week and they remember their kid and they pray for them before they have breakfast and uh, it's children like that. The clinic, we have a clinic there. Uh, these are some of the men that we work with. Uh, we drill water wells there. The Haitians do the drilling. Part of empowerment, I don't need to be the one that does everything. If you're going to work in empowerment, at the end of the day, I need to be in the back of the room and they need to be the heroes. Uh, it's not about me. It's about them. Uh, some of the work. This particular well was out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, just they never had clean water forever. Uh, we have micro businesses. We do micro credit so that our people don't want handouts in Haiti. They want a loan that's not connected to a loan shark because they jack up the rent and the cost more and more. A uh, hundred dollars, and there's a whole system I don't have time to talk about that we use. It was a, a Mohammed um, Yunus, uh, the Grameen Bank, created that is very successful. And what we do, these are some of the women making things. We have a fair trade center where the, we sell all kind of stuff made by the world's poor. Uh, and then this is another, just a picture. We go to, on trips. This is in Galveston. By the way, we take, we, we take the poor with us on the mission trips. Uh, sometimes we have this image, oh, let's go help those poor people. Let's take them down and serve. We take the very people you usually go to serve with us. Better kids are wonderful, but they're lousy in terms of, uh, doing construction. They don't even know which end of a saw to grab. And, and so they're great with playing with urban children, but they're not too good. So we take the homeless and the, the Bader students, and we go on these trips. This was in Galveston. I have a son that does what we do in Galveston, and, and uh, they become friends. These are some of our urban teens. Uh, this is the picture of the poverty simulation. That's all you can get to see, because I'm going to you come. Now let me talk about Church on the Bridge. I am pastor of a church that meets under a bridge for 23 years. Uh, for the last, this started with, this was the bridge right across from the street from Baylor. The guys, Pam handled on the corner, and um, there was a taco cabana on this side, and Janet and I were having breakfast one morning about 20-something years ago, and we said, uh, she said, let's just go across the street and invite them over for breakfast and learn about homelessness. They can tell me about it. I'm, I'm not an expert. They are the experts. They live it. So we invited them over, bought their breakfast, and for two hours we listened. And they said, hey, this is fun. Let's do it again next week. Well, I'm, I knew I bought breakfast. I'm not, I'm not stupid. But then they came back and brought more friends. And then we did it the third week. And the third week, I couldn't do it anymore. Breakfast was about $250. And I said, I can't afford that anymore, uh, which is what became the Friday morning breakfast. That's where that came from. But they said, hey, why don't you come across the street and do some training and teaching with us uh, under the, uh, teach us the Bible or whatever. And my wife sings and plays the guitar. So five guys showed up. It was loud. These, these are, there's four actually overpasses. And uh, so we came and they said, let's do it again next week. So five guys became 12, 12 became 20. And also the Baylor kids showed up and a community person showed up. When you come today, this is not an abnormal Sunday. 300 people. They're not all poor. In fact, just the opposite. And we, we don't distinguish between the rich and the poor. They're black, white, and brown. They're rich and poor. There are people from the streets and from the university. There are mentally ill people sitting next to professors from the seminary. We, we actually believe that the, the, the equality of sense of we are all brothers and sisters. We're family, folks. You, you may not, you may have more. Here's what we do, though. In our meaning, well-meaning to do good for others, we take a condescending approach, a patronizing. Let me help you. Oh, you poor person, you're homeless. Yeah, there are times for that, but let me tell you, there's other things we need to be doing besides raising money for food and coats and that kind of stuff. For example, uh, we do a big deal on racial reconciliation. MLK is one of our favorite days. We always acknowledge the importance of what King's work was about. We work through issues together. We sit, the African Americans lead the small groups that morning to talk about race and let's get honest about it. Uh, we do a big we shall overcome thing at the end. and it's, We do the same thing for Cinco de Mayo with the Hispanics and beat the death out of a pinata before we leave. Um, and then uh, 
we, we uh, have, have some small groups. We play together. This is a part of my life. Now, I'm 66 years old. Every year it hurts a little bit more. When we play touch football, we, just, we do it on Super Bowl Sunday. We call it the toilet bowl. And we go play football, and then we eat, have a chili cook-off. So if the football game didn't kill you, the chili will, and then we go straight to the emergency room. So, but this is, this is now, this guy, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. I just want you to remember his, oh, no, I think I've got his picture now, maybe. I don't know. That guy on the end, just remember him. And then uh, this is just a, one of the group trips we take. That may be it. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about two stories, and then if we have time, you can ask some questions. For me, coming out of the Christian worldview, I was very critical of the church. I loved the church because I do believe it, it is a, the, one of the best agencies to change a culture. We work urban poverty. I'm a part of a national group called Christian Community Development Association that works among the poor. And uh, some of my heroes, uh, like John Perkins and others, that are doing some amazing stuff in big cities all over America. We have a Texas network that as well does the same. We do training for that. But more importantly, uh, what we discovered is that there has to be um, some life back in the church because we got pretty mono purpose. We just came, sang a few songs, listened to a sermon, went home, did nothing about it. Well, in our mind, the teachings of Christ are pretty radical. I mean, radical. And we've, we've domesticated that thing and beat it into something that makes it easy, nice for everybody, and pat people on the back. Um, I am confident that he upset the culture. And you don't go become radical for radical's sake. What you do is live out the truth. To learn to love your enemies, to do good to people who hurt you, that's radical stuff. Our culture, listen to the political stuff. I mean, it's demeaning, it's vitriolic, it's everything but what we want today. So how do you break the, the patterns that even the Christian community and churches have gotten caught up in? We're more isolated on Sunday morning than any other uh, institution in America. The church is either white or black or brown doing their own thing. Why? Because we should be the ones breaking the barriers, but we're never breaking the barriers. We're the last ones to catch up. We're more worried about the length of shorts that people are wearing than we are about getting past some of these tougher issues. So we uh, have gotten to live out a sense of call, and I don't, I'm not an angry prophet. I am a practitioner. I believe it. My kids have grown up in it. This is not s silly stuff for us. This is serious. But what we've watched is the, the sleeping giant of the church that is one of the best ways to change inner cities. Uh, and I'm not talking about go help those poor people. Please don't hear that. Uh, we, we are working out of relationships. The first thing we do is not go do any. You know the worst thing you can do when you go take a trip? Don't go downtown and say, oh, you poor person, let us paint your house for you. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Let us come... Because if they are not a part of the solution to the problem, then, then we're doing more harm than good. What could be worse than the 16-year-old inner city kid sitting on the couch while a bunch of students are out there painting his house? He needs to be out there. Uh, what can mama do? We work together for the same end. And if we're going to change America, I'm convinced it's not going to happen by a, another political change. Uh, it's going to happen when grassroots people who love God and love each other begin to live out stuff they already know. But it takes courage. And if you're going to change the world, you know you pick college kids. You are the guys that change the world. You're the ones that can go work in leper slums and go across to the housing projects because you're, you're, you've got enough courage. But by the time you reach 27, 8 years old and you've got a wife or a husband and you've got two kids and you're worried about how much money, we get sucked into the system. Now, again... I'm not saying that's evil or wrong to live in a nice house or drive a nice car. I'm not suggesting that. But for me, I can't fathom not caring for that mama holding that baby because she will forever be in my mind because I know her and I saw that child die. I've buried a bunch of homeless people. I've, I've been in the middle of the pain. And so my resources, my time are, are different today because of that. And many of you will go on and make a ton of money and you'll live a happy life. You'll get married and have great kids and grandkids. And that's, that's not wrong. But when, it's, when I look back in my life, I want to know that I've invested in what I believe to be right and it has an impact on the community. Whether it does or not, it's not my, my deal. But I just want to be faithful to my end of it. Okay? So let me take, I know we're, we're 55 minutes. Let's take just a few minutes. Let me show you my trick. I didn't show you my trick. Here's my, let me see my trick. So when I get to pointing, uh, sometimes I forget and I forget to, to point. Get, get that on film, would you? Okay. 
Let's spend about four and a half minutes talking about uh, some things that I just said, okay? Uh, what questions do you have? Uh, what is it you want to to uh, discuss for a few minutes here? Right. Grocery store. Oh, God, I always forget it. Right across the street from the cafe, we're building a grocery store. Not, we're making a grocery store. It used to be an old Safeway grocery store in 1925. As the po poverty came in and encroached, then the uh, convenience stores took over. They're very predatory. Lottery tickets, 40 ounces, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of, of mess. And so... Um, Finally, we were able to purchase the building after many years of negotiating with these two guys that were charging way too much for it. So we brought the neighborhood together. Community development is bottom up. In other words, I don't go fix people, tell them what they need. I, knew, I know some of these things, but we bring them together. So 70 people show up from the neighborhoods. We made this list, said, what is it you want to uh, do? And they said, well, we, we think this needs to be a grocery store. So grocery stores are hard to pull off. They only have about a 1% to 2% profit today on food. It's a very low margin. That's not a good business plan. But what grocery stores do today is they sell TVs and computers and everything else but food, uh, or at least half food. So we can't do that. We don't want to do that. So we're working through some models. Uh, there's been a few models around the nation that have been doing it. So we're st still trying, and I think it'll happen. So sometime, hopefully around September, there will be a grocery store called the Jubilee Food Market across the street that the neighborhood people want. So those of you involved in community development or in planning, remember the people with the problem must be a part of the solution to the problem. It's very big. What else? Yes, sir. Well, I think what you're doing is very impressive, and uh, you're living out your Christian calling. Uh, as you probably know, um, these days the issue is between different religions. So you are living out your Christian calling. Do you reach out to other religions? Absolutely. Muslims, Absolutely. You know, I, the Hindu in the corner grocery store is just as important as I am. You know, God made him, whatever I, however I view that. I want to find healthy ways to love other people. I, I'm, I, my first interest is not going to change his worldview. My first interest is, I uh, wonder what he's doing for Thanksgiving, because probably he didn't have anywhere to go. Maybe he should come to our house and have Thanksgiving lunch with us. It is crossing the barriers which takes courage because we've been so, we're, everybody's a terrorist if they're a Muslim. That's such a lie. It's so wrong. And so we have to find ways to love people. And then in the midst of those things, we're going to have discussions about faith issues. And it's okay. It's okay to disagree, but we need to talk at some point uh, if we want to. Uh, I'm not sure what Ghana is like. I know in, uh, isn't it Nigeria where they always have a, whoever wins the presidency if they are Christian or Muslim, if their president if their president is Christian, then the vice president has to be Muslim or vice versa. Is it similar to that? Well, in, in Ghana, if you are president or you are from the south, then your vice president has to be from the north. Oh, okay. Okay, so same kind of deal. Can you imagine right now the political atmosphere we have? <laughs> if, if if Donald Trump becomes president and Bernie Sanders is vice president, you know, <laughs> we're already looking. Janet and I said we're we're looking for another country to move to if this thing keeps going. Like we it's like it's just. But but here's my here's the deal. I don't put a lot of hope in that. I'm not I'm not anti-American by any by any means. Please don't understand this. But my hope for the system politically to change our culture is very low. But my hope for people like you is high, because I believe. When you become, get an ideology that you believe in, and I can encourage you to live honestly toward that ideology, that you will be able to begin to, to be more faithful. And so you got to have people around you. You can't do it by yourself. You know, it's, a, it's a community kind of thing. But clearly you will, and not just, just by religious worldviews. I mean, I'm, we work with uh, lots of folks who are very, very different from us, and uh, I'm not better than they are in terms of how you build relationships it, you know, poor people can tell if you're legit or not. You look each other in the eye. You, you, there's nonverbal stuff that I think sometimes we forget. It's not talking people to death. It's just caring. And uh, that takes some effort on our part that we have learned. To do. Yes, sir. Jim, Jimmy, you shared a couple of uh, important definitions, definition of compassion. That, uh, you share a definition of leadership yeah. from your perspective. Yeah. Uh, bottom up. You know, again, I will confess from my Christian worldview, here is Jesus right before he's taken to be crucified, and he gets down and he washes the feet of his disciples. 
That's the model we believe in. It is servanthood that becomes leadership. It is not me telling you I'm the leader or making you follow me. Uh, you, you can choose me if you want to, but it's only because you think I would be a better leader. Leaders are the ones. I have a co-pastor in this African American named Charles Benson. I love Charles Benson. He is six foot seven. His foot is this big. My foot's about this big. And um, nobody gets us confused. Uh, Charles, uh, I had I had prayed for years for an African American or Hispanic pastor, and still, and and I have no trouble with women pastors. So. Maybe before I die, there'll be three or four on that team because I don't know that, I mean, just just because um, I started it doesn't mean that I need to lead it. So real leadership means get out of the way. So Charles Benson, I look up one day, is the man in the back who is putting up the chairs and caring for the people. And I said, you know, would you consider, I said, I'm not going to go out and hire a black to be co-pastor with me because that's just plain old wrong. I believe that God will call the right people. So Charles Benson has been now co-pastor with me for the last eight years. Love that man. And and so we live out our calling together. I'm over here at Mission Waco doing all the stuff. He's back taking care of the sick in the hospital and other things. But we have this friendship that crosses barriers and height and things that, that have become very meaningful for me. So I would say it, it's always going to be... I don't deny the importance of education. I've got a doctorate in... Uh, theology, and I, I mean, I, I know stuff, but that doesn't make me a bit better than the little lady on the back row of my church who doesn't have a high school education, but she's important. So when you value people through serving them, and then you find places for everybody to play together. You, you create opportunities because we need to work together on this stuff. What else? Should we have time? Um, if I can answer any questions from you individually feel free to, to grab me at the end. I'll stick around for just a little bit. I think we're having pizza down at 021. So, uh, Even if you don't care about what I said, there's still pizza. There's still pizza. <laughs> um, so please uh, convene down there, and, you, and Jimmy will be down there. You can have some more. Do you all give him a round of applause? Thank you. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the building, if you just go down this hallway, there's some spiral steps to go straight down there, and across the hallway is 021. We'll be down there. Please go. Great job. I bet you get tired of listening to me.